Whether you know it or not, you could play I Spy Something Volcanic all day on New Mexico's highways. For tens of millions of years, Mother Earth spewed molten rock and ash across the state like confetti at a Macy's Thanksgiving parade. Look in practically any direction, and you'll see the results of eons of geologic decorating, craters, cinder cones, lava flows, and mountains that have blown their tops. Take the asphalt less traveled, and instead of the usual roadside attractions and rattlesnake museums, you might find yourself on what looks like an abandoned set of the Lord of the Rings. Look more closely, and the volcanic terrain reveals stories of creation. Homes for ancient man, and the history of other planets. But don't be fooled by our placid panoramas. Keep in mind, New Mexico's volcanoes are only hibernating. So a big question remains, when and where will they erupt again? Welcome to the Volcano State. Although the state's volcanic activity goes back hundreds of millions of years, it was about 65 million years ago that these leviathans ushered out the age of dinosaurs. Where the ground once rumbled in New Mexico from plodding seismosaurs, it now heaved as the sleeping monsters awakened from beneath. About 20 million years ago, the golden age of volcanism began when the crust beneath New Mexico started to stretch and pull apart along a north-south axis forming what we know as the Rio Grande Rift, a geologic feature found in only a handful of places around the world. As the crust pulled apart, land in the middle sank, while the rift pushed up the crust on either side, creating several distinct mountain ranges, most notably the Sandias, and a wide valley that extends from southern Colorado to El Paso. The rift allowed magma to rise to the surface along its length, and volcanoes erupted like firecrackers. A few million years later, volcanoes again remodeled New Mexico's landscape along another weakness in the crust known as the Jemez lineament. It was a series of eruptions running roughly northeast to southwest that sculpted some of our most famous volcanic features from Zuni Salt Lake to Mount Taylor and Cabazon to Capulin. In fact, there are more than a dozen distinct volcanic fields within the state's borders featuring well-preserved examples of every type of volcano known. And reminding us that geology is destiny. One thing about volcanoes is that people are tremendously fascinated by them. And most geologic processes happen over hundreds, thousands, millions of years, whereas volcanoes happen fast. And most cultures in places where there are active volcanism have some kind of deity associated with the volcano. They make offerings to the volcano. And it's really, it's, it's something that entrances people. And having been around active volcanoes, I can completely understand that because they're so dynamic. They're almost like a living thing. The Acoma people, like almost all Native American people, hold this hold the land in, in really high reverence because it is part of, uh, it sustains us really. So it is part of just as important or if not more important than we are. We know that the earth is, is very much alive. Uh, it is, it's changing and it, it's constantly doing things that, it, that are reshaping itself and its surface. In a creation story, when we talk about the mountains being formed, this earth was flat and found there was no mountains, river, hills of such. And since the ocean could also come as high as it could be, then the mountains had to be formed to protect like the walls of a home to feel safe. 
In the Akama culture, volcanoes are the sacred portals through which the fire spirits travel, returning periodically to the Earth's surface to remind the people of their great power. The reminder left at the intersection of the Rio Grande Rift and the Jemez lineament won't soon be forgotten. That's where the Jemez Mountains formed the most famous geography in the state and the cradle for our very own super volcano. What makes the Valles Caldera so spectacular geologically and scenically is because they're formed in the top of a big mountain range. Mountain range made of the coalesced slopes and peaks of a, more than a dozen volcanoes. Volcanic history in the Jemez Mountains began long before the Valles Caldera form. First eruptions occurred here more than 15 million years ago. And so much of what we see here behind us are the rocks that were produced by those earlier eruptions, lava flows and layers of pumice and ash that accumulated on the landscape and built up the mountains before the Valles Caldera tore them down. Fast forwarding to approximately 1.6 and 1.2 million years ago, the Valles Caldera was the epicenter of two massive volcanic eruptions that left deposits several hundred feet deep in the surrounding area. The most recent eruption emitted an astounding 300 cubic kilometers of molten rock and debris before collapsing into the vacated magma chamber, leaving a depression 12 miles wide that can be clearly seen from space. Well, the type of eruptions that happen at the Valles Caldera are impossible to imagine. The ground probably shook for months. Earthquakes every day. There might have been smoking ground. But once the crack opened and the volcano really got going, it started with a blast. A huge, huge crack of thunder magnified thousands or millions of times. The initial blast sent out a shock wave so powerful it compressed air to the temperature of between 400 and 500 degrees, simultaneously leveling forests and incinerating trees. But that was just the beginning. Huge toxic steam clouds billowed from the volcano's mouth, skyrocketing some 30 miles into the stratosphere. Within minutes, chunks of pumice rained down. The column eventually collapsed under its own weight and crashed to earth sending superheated torrents of ash, steam, and gas racing across the countryside at supersonic speeds and forming the dramatic mesas of the Bandelier Tuff. Eruptions may have continued for weeks. Many of us remember the destruction wrought when Mount St. Helens erupted in 1980. But scientists believe the eruptions of the Valles Caldera were up to 250 times more powerful. Amazingly, the Valles Caldera isn't even the largest caldera in the state. That title goes to a collection of calderas in southwestern New Mexico that are some of the biggest in the solar system. Debris carried aloft by the ash clouds can be confirmed as far east as Kansas, Oklahoma, and Texas, and some scientists speculate ash may have reached the east coast. Well, let's believe the dust cloud would have blocked out the sun over much of the United States for years and altered the world's climate. This will happen again, perhaps not at the Valles, but at some other volcano here in the west. And when it does, it will truly stop life as we know it. After the last big eruption, magma continued to bubble for centuries beneath the caldera, pushing up the crust to form Redondo Peak. Occasionally, lava erupted to the surface, creating the ring of volcanic domes inside the caldera walls. The most recent eruption is believed to have occurred a mere 40,000 years ago, resulting in the cliffs of battleship rock. For all the destruction left behind by volcanism, eruptions provided the building blocks for civilizations. From obsidian quarries to salt lakes that became a destination for generations of native peoples.
Just southeast of the Valles Caldera sits the remarkable Bandelier National Monument, the site of Sankawi Mesa and Frijoles Canyon. While no one would have wanted to be in the area when the caldera erupted, it was a different story a million or so years later. The resulting mesas of volcanic tuff, or compressed ash and dust, provided fixer-upper homes. The ancestors of the San Ildefonso Pueblo were the first to build subdivisions at Sankawi. Later, the ancestors of the San Felipe, Santo Domingo, and Cochiti Pueblos carved out casas in the side of Frijoles Canyon. Yeah, these cavates are remarkably well preserved. This, this room is probably 500, 600 years old or so. And this plaster, this mud plaster that we're looking at, this is original. Above that, you can see the, the ceiling is blackened. I'm putting a layer of almost a creosote-like material. And what that does is that it seals the ceiling and prevents this stone from dusting on you. At nearby Frijoles Canyon, there are 1,100 excavated caves in a mile and a half stretch. Talk about urban density. The caves were multi-storied with walled additions made out of blocks of volcanic tuff harvested from the mesa tops. Many were designed to support looms. Nothing like working at home. In places such as Petroglyph National Monument in Albuquerque, ancestors of today's Pueblos and tribes acknowledged the sacredness of their relationship with Mother Earth by creating a library of images carved on basalt. About 150,000 years ago, a series of six volcanic eruptions punched through the Earth's crust along Albuquerque's western horizon. The magma poured out over softer sandy alluvial soils and then hardened. And over the course of the last 100,000 years, the sandy soils eroded underneath, leaving a cap rock of basalt, which came tumbling down. What we've got here at Petroglyph National Monument is a 17-mile-long volcanic escarpment on which we've got over 20,000 images carved by the ancestors of today's Pueblo people and also by other Native Americans traveling through the area, such as the Apache and the Navajo. For several thousand years, the volcanoes have been a very, very important part of the Pueblo people's cultural landscape. In fact, this is the middle of the Pueblo universe. Some of the native people believe that this is a place where their ancestors have passed from this world to the next world. Since we are, a, we are Pueblo people that believe we came from inside the grounds, any kind of passageway back to that underworld where we all came from is an important place for us, an important place to, to put our prayers, to get sent back to where we, are, where we all came from. While most of the state's volcanic activity dates to prehistoric times, the El Malpais National Monument near Grants and the Carrizozo Malpais in south-central New Mexico are carpeted with lava flows just a few thousand years old. The term Malpais means badlands and was used by Spanish explorers and travelers to describe jagged lava flows that not only made travel arduous, but were a hell on shoe leather and beasts of burden. There's been several flows that have been out in this area already. And I'm pretty sure even some of my ancestors may have been uh, witness to some of that. We are standing on the youngest volcanic eruption in New Mexico. It's dated at around 3,000 years. 3,000 years. That's younger than the Great Pyramids of Egypt, a blink of the eye in geologic time. And it means that people were here in New Mexico and probably saw this eruption happening. Another really cool thing about these lava flows is that you can see lots of gas bubbles. And those gas bubbles are really going to be useful, perhaps, for understanding the 
ancient uh, climate of Mars. Geologically, uh, New Mexico and Mars really aren't that far apart. They both have large, uh, long lava flows, Mar-type volcanoes, large calderas, and the high, dry, arid environment of uh, Mars, uh, very similar to New Mexico. So the fact is that we can actually uh, learn a lot about uh, the uh, conditions of volcanism on Mars by studying volcanoes and volcanic rocks right here in New Mexico. Some of our history about this is a really a cultural history story about the lava flow. There used to be a supernatural being that lived in this area and uh, he was just not one of the more friendly guys. And he was always uh, tricking people and, uh, and killing a lot of people. And the, these boy twin heroes wanted to try and save the Akuma people from this uh, supernatural being. This is a Hawaiian style lava flow. It's a very passive style of volcanic eruption. And the, the vent for this flow, the place where the lava came up through the Earth's crust, is defined by a little cinder cone that's at the north end of the flow. You can just see it on the horizon. These lava flows are very fluid, so they would have been about the consistency of molasses. So they would have just been oozing along the Earth's surface. And this is a very long flow. It's about 70 kilometers long. One of his techniques was to gamble with the people. And these boy twins found out the secrets of this being. So when they finally got here, they wagered with him. And, and he, being really confident about his wagering skills, knew that he would easily win anything that these hero twins had. So they kept upping the ante. And pretty soon he was up to their lives. Let's wager your lives. And they said, well, you need to wager something as important as our lives if, if we're going to wager. And, and, and I, the story that I've heard is he wagered his eyes. And in the end, the guys knew all his tricks, and they won the wager. And they took his eyes. As the lava flowed along the surface, a crust would have formed over the top of the lava. And then the lava would have ended up flowing basically through a tunnel and that tunnel would have allowed the lava to be insulated so it didn't cool off and freeze as fast as it would have if it hadn't had this tube system to transport it. This is the roof of the lava tube. So when this tube was active, this part would have been solid rock. And then where I'm standing, there would have been hot lava flowing actually this direction, flowing from the vent down towards the end. When the supply of lava was cut off at the vent, this tube eventually would have emptied out and when that happened, the roof of the tube, which wasn't very strong, would have collapsed down to form all this rubble you see all over the floor. The supernatural being, this deity that lived in this area was very upset. He said, I, I can't see to go after these people, so I'm gonna do something terrible to them. And he, he built this huge old fire and he started boiling this pine tar. And the story goes on to say is that's how a lot of this pine tar, which is what, what, what we see right now as the lava field, came flowing from his, his cauldron and, and trying to head its way toward Akuma to annihilate all their fields and all the animals and even the people. What we're looking at here are called pohoihoi ropes, the features that we're seeing on this surface. And these are features that form only on the most fluid types of lava. When you have the upper surface that's cooling and lava flowing underneath it, it rumples up the upper surface, forming these ropes. And a way that you can, an, a way that you can picture that happening is if you have a rug on a hard floor and you push the rug from one end, it forms wrinkles that look actually a lot like these ropes. So if you had been here on this island at the time that the eruption was happening, you probably would have been okay. You would have been maybe a little bit hot, but you, you could have actually walked right up to the edge of the flow without being hurt. The majestic profile of Mount Taylor looks down upon travelers along I-40 near Grants. It's a sacred mountain for many Native Americans and for scientists, a classic example of a composite volcano built from hundreds of different types of eruptions that began about three million years ago. It's a, very similar to the type of volcano that people think of. And in fact, Mount uh, Taylor probably had eruptions that were very similar to the eruptions that we are familiar with from Mount St. Helens, very explosive. So Mount Taylor probably originally had a 
more conical shape than it does today, uh, but we don't know what it really looked like. But uh, let's let's imagine that it was like Mount St. Helens was before it had its big top blowing eruption. So originally it could have actually swooped up and down to the other side in sort of this uh, classic volcano shape. While Mount Taylor rose into the sky, eruptions at Kilbourne Hole near Las Cruces about 180,000 years ago had the opposite effect, creating what Ken Willets calls a negative volcano or mar volcano. They are rare, except in New Mexico, where examples abound. This crater extends over a mile and a half towards the north, and it's over a mile wide at, at its middle part. And the Mar volcano forms in a very unique fashion. It forms by large steam explosions. Now the steam explosions here were caused by rising magma hitting groundwater, causing the groundwater to flash into steam in large explosions. Now when I say large, I really mean large. This crater gives evidence of explosions being up to as many as 50 times larger than the explosions over Hiroshima. The mantle of the Earth is uh, very far away from us. It's over 20 miles below our feet here. Yet this volcano acted in such a way that it really grabbed hold of that and brought that mantle right to the surface. And these are chunks of the mantle. They're composed of olivine, which is the lighter green, and pyroxene, which is the darker green, almost black color. Fortunately, the earth beneath New Mexico coughed up more than rare green rocks. In fact, volcanoes have been one of our leading economic development tools, leaving vast mineral deposits of turquoise, gold, and copper for prospectors, volcanic-rich soil for farmers and ranchers, not to mention fabulous scenery to lure tourists. But what everyone wants to know is when the next one is going to blow. Volcanism in New Mexico is dormant, not extinct. Continuous over tens of millions of years, there's no reason to think it stopped magically 3,000 years ago. Experts differ on the timetable for the state's next eruption, but based on history, one researcher predicts a 1% chance in the next 100 years, a 10% chance in the next 1,000. It could be a sedate lava flow or a catastrophic explosion. Nelia Dunbar is putting her money on the Socorro magma body. In central New Mexico, between about Bernardo and Socorro, there's geophysical evidence that there's a body of molten rock, or magma, at about 19 kilometers depth. And if you had to predict where the next volcanic eruption in New Mexico might occur, that would be a good choice. Now, if I had to guess, I might predict that it would be an eruption just like this eruption, this basaltic eruption of the Carrizoza Malpais. Most geologists are excited at the prospect. What wouldn't I give to see that happen in New Mexico? <laughs> it would be, this is a big topic of conversation among volcanologists in the state is when is the next eruption going to happen and where is it going to be and won't it be great when it happens? <laughs> it may be that we should, should think of these scenic landforms that are represented by volcanoes in New Mexico as as sleeping monsters, volcanoes that may awaken in the future, or new volcanoes that may appear in places where we haven't seen them in the past. When artists uh, speak of New Mexico, they frequently refer to the unique lighting, the color, the shapes of the landscape, and sort of an indefinable spirit of the landscape. I like to think that because uh, volcanoes are such an important part of what we see out of our front windows, that they're really responsible for some of that uniqueness. These mountains and the, the volcanoes uh, remains are, are important to us because it, it tells us the stories of what happened in the past and where are we going to go from here. And it's a reminder to us through the stories that these certain things have happened and it will occur 
even today and in the future. This Caloris is available on home video. To order, call 1-800-328-5663. This program made possible with major funding from the Department of Interior, Bureau of Land Management, sustaining the diversity of public lands for present and future generations, and a challenge cost share grant from the National Park Service through the Petroglyph National Monument, with additional funding from the Santa Fe Garden Club, a member of the Garden Club of America, and the New Mexico Geological Society Foundation.